Hello, I'm Norman Swan. Welcome to this programme on eating disorders, taking a holistic approach. The number of Australians with an eating disorder has probably doubled in the last 10 years to about 1 in 20. Eating disorders are commonest in young women, but the incidence in young men has been increasing and the problems don't necessarily disappear with age. It's actually likely that you have several patients with an eating disorder in your practice, but you may not know it. Typically, people will hide their symptoms, making early detection and intervention more difficult. And in rural Australia, the absence of local specialist services for people with eating disorders means that the burden of care falls to GPs. So this program is intended to assist you in early and effective intervention. We're coming to you across Australia through the Rural Health Education Foundation satellite network. And as usual, there are a number of useful resources available on the Rural Health Education Foundation's website. And that's at rhef.com.au. Now let me introduce our expert panel to you. Jenny O'Day is Associate Professor in Nutrition at the University of Sydney. Welcome, Jenny. Hello. Natalie Wilde is a recovery officer with the Eating Disorders Foundation of Victoria and has personal experience of an eating disorder, as you'll discover. Welcome, Natalie. Thank you. Gay Clues is a psychologist with a master's degree in sports science and eating disorders. She's a former world number one triathlete and currently runs the psychology counselling department at Radford College in Canberra. Welcome, Gay. It's great to be here. Thanks, Norman. And Jane Raphael is a general practitioner with 28 years experience from Bangalore in New South Wales, where she runs a women's health and wellbeing practice. Welcome. Hi, Norman. Natalie, when did you first wake up to the fact you might have had a problem with your eating? Now, looking back, it probably started when I was 12, when I started Year 7. We're looking at the 80s here. So uh, awareness wasn't so great with eating disorders. Um, I'd started school, the environment was new, independence was being promoted in us. We'd gone from being protected in primary school, I suppose. Um, my parents' parenting skills toughened up a little, teenage hormones, etc. Uh, and one of the common sayings in our house unintentionally was what will everybody else think so I sort of knowing my nature was as it was anyway but uh, I was developing the ideal of uh, you had to be a certain person for everybody else it was important that everybody liked you um, it was important to achieve it was important to do all these things and I wanted to get it right so and did that include how you looked Looks, um, looks. for me it came secondary, not with everybody. Initially for me it wasn't about weight. It was about uh, anxieties for me. Uh, as, as I tried harder and harder to be all for everybody, uh, the anxieties inside were turmoil. Um, and that anxiety increased a need not to, I, I wouldn't feel hungry so I wouldn't eat. Coming so along, you think the anxiety put you off your food? Initially I Literally would say. Literally as simple as that? Yes pretty much because the, the need for making sure everybody else was happy um, created internal anxieties, which were just um, it's pressure, a lot of pressure and high expectations you put on yourself inside, uh, things you just cannot live up to, but you think you should, so you keep on fighting. And as this was happening, uh, people would give you comments like, ah, oh, you're growing up, you're losing your baby fat, you're looking great. So. Without so you got meaning all this to. Feedback that you should yeah, have got. I was getting this amazing positive feedback. Oh, you're great fun to have around. You're awesome at parties. You know, <laughs> all the sort of things that that my uh, facade was doing a great job, but the behaviours that I was um, picking up along the way uh, were, to me, what was creating those. So I went along like this, and as as the years gone, it. It's important to understand that eating disorders don't happen overnight. You don't say, gee, I'm going to wake up with an eating disorder. It's a, it's a gradual thing. Drip, so, drip, drip. Yeah. So within 12 months, I'd probably halved food intake, maybe less. Uh, by the time I was 14, I was on very little um, and hiding all of this. Very secret thing. Nobody knows about it. You, you, you become, you, your social life starts to revolve around eating patterns so if someone's having I was very at the time I had a boyfriend and it was a great way to guise things I'd say I'd be at home and I'd say oh, I'm having lunch at his house and I'd get to their house and I'd say I had lunch at home so it, or when we're going out socially I'd sometimes say to people oh I can't go for dinner because I'm just going out with so and so but I'll be there after tea so I was able to to cover up I suppose. And what's going through your head at the moment can you remember what you were thinking it was just 
it was active food avoidance? You just got over some sort of I threshold or what? I think it's, it, it becomes first and foremost about control. Um, I, I felt a great sense of control. I was, I was out of control in so many areas of my life, um, in, in my own expectations of myself. It wasn't anybody else who does it to you, but you... So you weren't, weren't getting at anybody? Um, yeah, it, it, was, it was... I wasn't striving for what I, was, I, I thought I was supposed to achieve in my own self. Uh, food was one thing I could control at all costs. I could um, eliminate it uh, and nobody could stop that. Um, I could monitor it, nobody could stop that. It, it, was, it was the one thing that I, I had and it, it, it served a purpose for me. It, it gave me strength where I didn't have, I had zero self-esteem, yet everybody thought I had lots. Um, I, was, I was covering up all the time. So this one thing gave me a sense of rebalancing, I suppose, somewhere where I could manage something. And did you do things that sometimes people do, which is like turn to cooking, paradoxically, so that you're actually in food preparation? I worked at McDonald's. <laughs> which well, that's enough to make you anorexic, I have to say. <laughs> Which was a really great thing for me because I would say I ate at work. Um, I had food around me all the time, so I'd say I just nibbled while I was nibbling the whole time, so I didn't need to eat. Um, it's, it's amazing what you put yourself in. You actually put yourself in food preparation zones, so people think that you're you're dealing with food. Um, you comment on food, you'll say, oh, that lunch looks fantastic, or yeah, gee, I'd really like that, knowing darn well that you might not actually get to it, but you want people to think that you will. Um, so it's, it's, there's a lot of hiding and secrecy. But your parents must have noticed. They're not really looking. You, you, you hide, you hide it, because there, there's different stages to an eating disorder, and in the early stages, you don't believe you have a problem. So you don't want there's a part of you that doesn't want anybody to know because if they know, then you have to deal with it. And you don't, it, it's, that's not an option. Everything else is out of control in your life. So why would you let someone take away the one thing that you felt good about? In a destructive way, you felt, you feel good about it. it it's, it's, um, it's taking a voice that you don't have. It, so it's giving they, you a voice. did they ever find out about it? When I was 15, I went, I was rushed to hospital with uh, what they thought was an appendix attack and I had to be weighed, which no one weighed you. <laughs> had to be weighed for medication purposes and they opened me up and I had, uh, it wasn't just my appendix, I had large ovarian cysts and they realised that I wasn't, I didn't have regular periods. So I was kind of busted <laughs> on, on top of the fact in that I In a fairly major way. Yeah. Uh, in, so also, how much of your body weight had you lost? Um, it's, I'm not really sure. They don't really tell you well, at that stage they didn't tell you what you were. I knew I was well below what I was supposed to be, but I could hide it. I managed to hide that by the clothes I wore, um, by my actions, different things that you do. You can, you can, it just depends on the situation you're in, but I managed that. So the doctors um, put the big threat on me and told me that um, if I didn't start eating immediately, uh, lack of knowledge in a big way, uh, they would put me in a hospital ward. Um, I would have a sink with no basin it just a bin under it uh, they would monitor when I went to the toilet they would give me three of these thick mixtures a day that I had to drink and if I didn't drink Sounds it like Guantanamo Bay mm, they would punish me so punishment entailed uh, not seeing my parents no radio no TV one thing at a time they were going to take off me so um, telephone calls the boyfriend which was important at the time you know so <laughs> in retrospect probably. In, in, probably the most important thing at the time and that scared me to death so my beautiful facade, I just said, sure, no worries, I'll start eating, that's okay, I don't want to do that, that will be fine. So I got away from the hospital, which was great, got away from the doctors, thought that was very clever, but I didn't get away from my mum. Mum was then on full alert, my dad was on full alert. Um, they were on plate duty. <laughs> absolutely. So at a time that... And this I, is what destroys families. Absolutely, because the, they start to blame themselves. And they've got their own issues going on as a parent you know that you have your own issues going on and you just don't, um, you start to think, well, did I drop a ball somewhere? Did I, did I miss something? And it's not their fault. Uh, if you have three children in a family, how come one gets one and the other two don't? And you're brought up the same way. So it's definitely traits that go with it. But, um, so how do they handle it? What, what sort of things did they do at the table, meals times and so on? My parents handled it really badly. Um, I'll, not intentionally. And to be fair to them, lots do. Oh, 
yeah, also lack of knowledge. There was no knowledge. I mean, it, with, without the knowledge of it, you try and do what's right and you try and fix it. So they, uh, they tried to fix it. So by fixing it was probably the absolute worst thing for me is um, they told, or I'll say my mum did. I'm not sure about dad. He was at work a little bit more. But mum told people. So my big secret was out and that terrified me even more. So, um, so I, that really leaves you feeling naked and vulnerable in the middle of the street. That left me nowhere. Now, I don't know who knew and who didn't, but you're so afraid of judgment. Judgment is such a massive, massive issue for you. So, and, and caring what people think and, and being perfect all the time. So when someone discloses all of that, you, um, you don't know what to do. So by telling everybody when you don't want people to know, um, it, it causes another issue. For me, anorexia became bulimia. Um, I, I, I felt like I had to start eating in front of people. I was being watched, I was being monitored. I was, I was told I couldn't go here, I wouldn't be driven here unless I ate this. I wouldn't be able to do this unless I did that. So, so was bulimia rebellion or you No, just... bulimia was making the eating, keeping the eating disorder alive. The eating disorder was the only thing I had control over in my own mind. So I needed to keep it. It was really important to me to keep it at that time. I was at a stage where I didn't believe it was a problem um, I protected it. So I would behave the way I was supposed to behave and I would almost count how long it was going to take me to get to the next place so that I could do what I needed to do to protect and support my eating disorder. So you avoided battles at the meal table in fact? Absolutely. I was working, when I wasn't at school I was working five to six, on school holidays I worked five to six days a week at McDonald's double shifts. Um, I would go to people's houses for tea, um, I would, I had lots of different, different ways of, and, and when I had to manage it in front of people, I would manage it And did you ever get so ill they were worried about your life? Um, things were starting to falter, but I would hide things. I had severe headaches every day. Um, it, they were mind numbing. Um, I would pass out at sport. Sport became a really non-event for me. I loved, I, I actually liked my sport, um, but I would black out if I'd go for a hundred. Uh, you know, 100 run, so, you know, sorry, a 100 metre run, I'd, I'd black out. So I would start avoiding sport. Um, my social life I'd start avoiding because I was tired and because most of it revolved around food. Um, so it had its, it definitely had its effects. Um, your menstrual cycle's not normal, so you're sort of all over the place there as well. Uh, your bones aren't developing properly. I had um, curvature of the spine. I was, being, I was hanging upside down on a rack <laughs> because my bones weren't forming properly. Great adolescence. Oh, it's awesome. Uh, going into the city with your friends, I would have to sit. They would all go shopping and I would sit for an hour and a half on a seat and just say, oh, look, my back hurts. I'm going to have to sit. And none of that created an insight for you? I was, I, it's all I knew. That's what I knew. That was my teenagers, teenage years. And I, I could see that others So what got you out of it? I, I think everybody has an aha moment. And even with all the things I've done since then, I still see so many people and they all have these aha moments. And they can be as small or as big as you like. I think you've got to be aware that there is some kind of conscious awareness somewhere that you're not doing the right thing at all times. And you don't like it. You, you absolutely detest it so often, but you, at the same time, you, you need it. You're hooked on it. You, you need it, yeah. Um, it's keeping you alive. It's keeping you... Uh, surviving in an, in an outside universe um, and I was 19 when I had my aha moment and I was at the next boyfriend's house who is now my husband <laughs> and his family didn't know me very well and they were huge eaters and I was dreading the first meal at their house they when are you having tea here when are you having tea here and I'd say oh, I will I'm just busy always busy I was always busy and uh, I sat down to this meal and it was massive and I felt sick and I wanted to cry and I thought they're not going to like me anymore. They're, they're just going to not accept me for who I am and it will continue. And I shuffled things around a little bit and, you know, waited till the end. And my now mother-in-law picked my plate up from the front of me and she said, oh, she said, oh, I'm so sorry, Natalie. She said, we are such big eaters. She said, I'll just have to give you less next time. And the relief was so intense and the acceptance of who I was was huge. Um, had she tweaked or do you think no this idea. was just a natural reaction? She had no idea. They are a very self-confident family. They like who they are. They all like who they are. Um, they're very direct. 
uh, which was quite daunting at first, but ended up being my saviour, I think. Um, just amazing human beings. They like themselves. And that was a really foreign concept. I was so busy trying to get everybody to like me, I'd lost. So you kind of did what some treatment regimes do now, is take you back to basics and almost reteach you how to eat. Absolutely. And they were, um, I have to say, a lot of my retraining and getting back from beyond was I did myself. That is a very rare thing. 98% um, of people cannot do that. Um, on saying that, I did have a lot of help in the people that were around me. I learned what worked for me. I learned what was really what, what were the influencing factors in my life. I learned to communicate a lot better. So from the people who didn't understand and who had gone through the whole stages with me, they were able to re-establish what I needed. Um, it took probably three years, baby steps, lots of baby steps, relapses. Um, but my focus was always, I had an ultimate goal that there were so many things I wanted to achieve and I understood at that point that I couldn't have any of them with the eating disorder. So I had to make a choice. I had to say, I can have this or I can have this and this looks so much better. And, and um, now when you eat? I don't think about it. There, there becomes a stage where you um, occasionally I'll sit there if someone knows that I've recovered, which more people know now than they ever knew my whole life. Because well, it's I, a bit hard to keep um, it quiet when you go on television. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I sometimes will think, oh, I'm, I need to go to the bathroom. Is anybody looking over my shoulder? But it'll be a brief moment and it's gone and I'll think, well, I know I'm fine and I know I'm good. And um, I look at the most amazing things that I've done with my life, the things that I've achieved. I have two beautiful sons. I have um, a great husband, fantastic relationships. Um, all over the place. Uh, my career is is great. Everything that um, everything that I could have dreamed of has been achieved by just being who I am, not by being who I think everybody wants me to be. Well, we'll come back to your story and how you're passing that on to others later. Jenny, what are we talking about here when we talk about um, eating disorders? Yes, um, the description was really quite um, familiar. The, the anorexia nervosa. Um, we have a medical disorder, we have a psychological dis disorder and, and it becomes a, an extreme psychiatric disorder. So it's a combination of But some of people problems. argue, like the Swedes argue, that it's not psychiatric at all. It's um, described, almost described here that you go for whatever reason, whether you, you see a model in, a, in, in Marie Claire who's thin and you decide you're going to be like that and you restrict your eating and then somehow something biological happens to you and it's nothing psychiatric at all. Is it fair to call it a psychiatric disorder, do you think? Well, it becomes psychiatric when the brain is starved, when the brain shrinks from starvation, when you're in that starvation state it becomes psychiatric because the, the patient can't think clearly, they can't undergo counselling because the, the brain is not operating normally. But there is a genetic component. We see um, identical twins with anorexia nervosa. Uh, we see obsessive compulsive disorder run through families. We see these patterns in families, definitely. So, th so there's, there's anorexia nervosa, there's bulimia, and there's something they call ednos, which is mm -hmm. eating disorders not other otherwise specified. Just give us a sense of what they are and how they're defined. Well, anorexia nervosa is the fear of food, the refusal to maintain weight, the refusal to, to gain up to a normal weight, um, anxiety around food, worrying about being fat, obsessing about being f fat. Um, the, there is the uh, restricting type, which is the very thin girl whose mother drags her into your office and says she won't eat. There is the purging type of anorexia nervosa, which is very, very dangerous, where they're not eating and they're purging. And, um, and then bulimia nervosa is the binge eating, the out of control eating, really quite frequent, um, with or without purging, uh, with, or, with or without something else like laxatives or diuretics. So they're the two classics, but the eating disorders not otherwise specified is a whole gamut of these behaviours together you can't make a diagnosis, a full diagnosis of anorexia nervosa. They may not have lost their menstrual period, 
um, but you can't make a diagnosis of bulimia nervosa. So you have this whole array of disordered eating and that's quite common. That's about 20% of young women. And it's dangerous? It's very dangerous. Uh, the classic fainting, passing out, blacking out, low, low blood pressure, um, electrolytes that become upset because of the vomiting and the, the laxative abuse, very dangerous. And in fact, uh, it has a very high mortality rate. Anorexia nervosa has a high mortality rate. And what about ADNOS? Eating disorders not otherwise specified? Well, it depends, you know, what sort of array of symptoms they have, what sort of behaviours, whether there's depression with it, whether there's any sort of suicidal ideation. You know, you really have to do a whole assessment of each individual patient. And what about binge eating? Binge eating disorder, also known as compulsive overeating, uh, where there, there is not a full diagnosis of bulimia nervosa, but there's episodes of binge eating out of control and, um, of course, weight gain. So if you, if you can do a sort of history, a dietary history, you, you, you can talk and, about those binges. And the prevalence? Well, prevalence of ednos is about 20%. So it's, you know, very... In the community? Yeah, in the young, young female community. Eating disorders... So one in five young women have an eating disorder? Yes, yes. That's probably an underestimate. It's probably just the tip of the iceberg. And we know that young, young men as well are affected. So anorexia nervosa, about one in every 200 teenage girls. Bulimia nervosa, about 2% at least. I had 3% of young men in my study of university men. And ednos, the whole array, um, is at least 20 percent. So Gay, you've, uh, you were the psychologist to the 2000 Olympics, you've been heavily involved in sport. How does it present in young men? Well it's interesting because I actually have worked for a long time in an environment where eating disorders are probably statistically much higher than what they even are in the general population. So when I was back doing my masters, some of the um, studies that I was reviewing as part of my literature review were 20, 30, 40, 50 percent depending on the sport that you know that those those um, individuals participated in so I would tend to see more of it in young males in the sporting environment when it was maybe um, need to make weight so you might have categories that the individual is trying to make like say for example a lightweight rower or someone is trying to make it a category in judo uh, boxing etc where there's a lot of pressure on the individual to actually be able to lose that weight so that they can compete in a lower category um, you would also see it sort of in your aesthetic sports, so your sports such as gymnastics, um, diving, those sorts of sports. And you'll see it in your endurance-based sports, and I've certainly had to work with individuals, say, from distance running, both male and female, um, where they want to have a big motor and a small body. So there's a lot of uh, pressure in the actual culture of that industry that's very, very body-focused and very weight-focused. And dancing. Ballet, and dancing, dancing is another one. Any sort of dance as male or female. So they say that in men, in young men, it's an exercise disorder, if you like, rather than an eating disorder. But is that a mis misconception, that it's an eating problem as well as over-exercise? I actually think it's probably more towards the exercising and the body component of it because the other group that I've worked with over the years have been young men that have become very body conscious, that have wanted to build their bodies up for bulk and size. And so the obsession with the eating or not eating to have the lean body weight's been part of that. And sometimes that's been a protective mechanism for individuals who have been bullied or abused and they're needing to feel that they can physically um, protect themselves so that they can develop that sort of obsessive behaviour around their body shape, image, size, sort of going down that pathway. And did you notice any problems in yourself when you were competing at an elite mm -hmm. level? Um, absolutely. I was at 54 kilos and 173 centimetres, one would say, wow, that's pretty light. But in my particular sport, I was actually always one of the larger athletes mm -hmm. and I, I was constantly made to feel as if, you know, I should be thinner and I, and I should be lighter and, and uh, that pressure sort of, you know, was always there. And whilst I never um, developed an eating disorder myself, I struggled all the time with that internal voice being involved in an industry that was telling me all the time that I'd actually run better if I was lighter. So it's pervasive in the, in the industry. Less wind resistance when you're on the bike <laughs> with the shaved legs. Jane, in general practice, this, this story that you just heard, typical from Natalie, or 
is it a different picture when you, on average? Well, I think when um, a person presents or a, um, an adolescent presents in general practice, it's often quite a, a lot different to that because you just start with the tiniest little signs. Or, or unless you're there as a teenager who's brought in by a parent, where then you've, you might have a story presented by the parent, but as the doctor you're still going to have to find out from the teenager exactly what's going on. So that often we're not presented with such a, a, a thorough story as Natalie's told tonight. But so it's really being a bit suspicious, um, looking at size, listening for cues around, you know, dieting behaviour, wanting to lose weight, um, body image isn't quite what they would like of themselves and, um, and just keeping an eye on them physically as well. So know. Natalie, what do we know about personality traits and so on? Is there a personality type? Very much so. Um, although they don't necessarily script it, um, mo many people with eating disorders have uh, obsessive compulsive tendencies, uh, great uh, perfectionism, uh, need for control, great need for control. Um, caring very much about what other people think, uh, not wanting to be judged because of course that affects the ideal perfectionism. Very hard on themselves internally, often high achievers. Um, it's, uh, I've heard people say, oh, you must be so dumb to end up having an eating disorder. It's, um, or, or it doesn't fit an image or, a, or an age. It's, it's about, it is a lot more about your nature, I think, um, than any of those things. But the intellect is another one. Uh, many people who present with eating disorders are highly intelligent people. So Jenny, the stories you hear about women's magazines, girls' magazines, body image, uh, what you see on television, the father who says you're looking a bit fat, are all those true or is it really a person was just destined to, be, uh, to have a dis an eating disorder? It's a bit of both. It's, it's clearly a bit of both. There is a, a genetic component, there is a social component. I think we all, um, in our Western society, uh, we're all under pressure to be slim, to fit the, the perfect body, to not become um, overweight or obese. We're all under pressure. Um, and if the girl has that tendency, then if she starts dieting, it's usually the dieting that leads to the eating disorder. But usually there's a very clear um, low self-esteem. And in fact, that's one of the strongest predictors of anorexia nervosa is very poor self-esteem the girl feels that she is worth nothing. But it doesn't help to be able to say, well, you're a fantastic person, because you don't believe it. Well, so the therapy is not falsely boosting the uh, self-esteem. It is when they, when they can get their weight up a little bit and they can feel better and they can participate, uh, truly participate in counselling, then that self-esteem building is very protective. It's very f protective for a child, any child. So, Gay, is recovery a myth? Some people say, well, once you've got it, you've always got it in some shape or form. It just sits behind the surface a little bit. Well, fortunately, it's not a myth. Um, if you look at, say, anorexia nervosa, they say that there's a good 50% will recover from that. And then, of course, the, a large percentage of the remaining will actually learn to manage it, but that might mean having to manage it throughout their lifetime. If you look at um, bulimia, they're looking at you know, a, a recovery rate of around 70%. So that means you've got the other 30% who once again will be learning how to manage it and manage it throughout their lifetime. So a few years ago, um, um, an, uh, an, an expert in, in anorexia nervosa and eating disorders studied the literature, wrote it up in the Lancet and said nothing works. Mm -hmm. Maybe family therapy, mm -hmm. but certainly all the other stuff that the so-called experts talk about in anorexia nervosa. And my understanding is that apart from certain types of family therapy, the only thing with randomised control trial evidence for working is the Swedish system where they have the computerised eating, they warm up, they, they treat it as a biological problem and, and don't treat it as a psychiatric disorder, the mendometer. Um, is it as nihilistic as that? I Jenny? think, I think um, you would call it success if you had someone who you diagnosed with anorexia nervosa and you kept them alive because there's a high mortality rate. So you have to look at what are you calling success, um, keeping them alive, preventing the, the suicide in bulimia, for example. That well, there's, works. There's certainly a lot of desperate parents out there the who, don't, who don't feel there's much on offer. Well, the refeeding mm. works. That will save the child's life. If you can get them into hospital, refeed them and, and you know, 
normalise their, their blood chemistry. Norman, what's interesting about the refeeding is that they've, they've done studies, they've looked at um, the eating disorders, they've looked at prisoners of war, they've looked at other people in terms of where they've actually looked at the starvation issue and it appears that it's the process of the starvation that is actually creating or contributing to a lot of the other um, psychological... Which is exactly what the Swedes say. Yes, is what they're saying. So, so they're saying that the starvation process has that really... You've got to refeed. You have to refeed. That's got to be the first and foremost. But we're also working with a very large continuum in terms of where the individuals present to us and where they are on that scale. And majority of them aren't at the refeeding end that we're actually working with and that we can pick it up earlier, work with it sooner, we're going to get the higher turnaround in terms of individuals. So what are the elements health. of the family therapy that work? I'm not a specialist in family therapy and um, I really do believe that it's a really important role. So in, in my case, I would refer out. But some of the aspects are, I think, in the family therapy work is that the young person really needs to feel that they are validated, that they're actually being heard. And I think, you know, Natalie's that nodding. Worth something. Yes. <laughs> that uh, that self-worth. That, that self-worth that comes from that from that family unit, um, recognizing and separating out that the individual is not the disorder. So you've got Natalie here, this beautiful, wonderful, gorgeous person, and then you have this disordered eating, and they're not two and the same. You're separating them out, and when you do that, you can then empower Natalie to actually see if she can take back control of her life. And then the person themselves can see themselves as a separate entity. It, it's very easy to, and you're right, it's very easy to think you've become the eating disorder. You have your own paranoias anyway, but then you think, well, everybody else thinks I am, so I am. And the family's, so. yeah, and the family's really important part in that process. Like, I've got this wonderful young student that is actually a peer of someone that has an eating disorder right now, and unbelievably insightful, and even at the age of 12 and 13, as a member of that family dynamic with working with the individual around the eating disorders has that capacity to tell me that he knows when he's talking to the anorexia versus when he's talking to his sister and he has strategies for choosing not to engage in the anorexia which is bossy and controlling and demanding so he has a oh yeah whatever but can engage and communicate with his sister. So you get positive reinforcement for normal behaviour. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. in the family systems, you know, it's, I look at that and I think, isn't this just mm. beautiful? Even a young person of this age can learn to be part of that healing process within the family. So, it's in, other words, uh, uh, so it's not, in other words, it's not deep and meaningful historical psychodynamic therapy. It's here and now cognitive based Reinfor doing sensible stuff, like reinforcing positive behaviours and not making a battlefield over dinner. Normalising eating is the mm. big challenge, isn't it? I mean, that, mm. that's what the family model does. It tries mm. to have the family sitting at the table having a normal meal. Jane, there's a few questions here, and uh, the first one is from a general practitioner in Queensland. As a general practitioner, what investigations are essential with eating disorders? Well, I think that with an eating disorder, you've got to look... Um, very carefully at the physical. So investigations, you're wanting to do a really full, you know, blood testing, looking at, you know, whether things from absorption like iron, B12, folic acid, which of course reflect also throughout other absorption issues. Just looking at things like cholesterol, blood sugar, and then of course liver function, function and kidney function, so that you can see Absolutely. how the body's electrolytes working. Electrolytes as well. Electrolytes. So that you've got an idea of how the body's working. Then there's also looking just cl um, clinically as well, you know, blood pressure, um, pulse rate, temperature, and just so that we're making sure that those two marry and that, that and then also the actual symptoms that the child Because I understand you can be have. a bit hypothermic. Yes, that's yeah. one thing that you can really Which the, what, the, the Swedish system on. warms you up, mm. even, and even in a hot climate. Yeah. Um, a psychologist in Victoria asks along the same lines, should we be using BMI, BMI as an indication of an eating disorder, Jenny? Well, you can. The, the, um, the number we use for a fully grown woman, an adult woman, would be 17.5, and anything below that is considered to be... Thin. An eating disorder. Really? Yes. Until otherwise proven. You can use that cutoff. But, but uh, we published a paper in The Lancet about BMI and pre and post uh, menarchial girls. And, you know, if they're post puberty, then they're naturally going to be bigger and heavier. So I think it's more a psychological, you know, have you lost weight? How do you feel about your weight? How would you feel about gaining weight? They're the classic questions that, that give you the answer about. Um, 
disordered body image. And so a question for you, Jane, from a general practitioner in Wagga. What uh, medications are advised with eating disorders? Should SSRIs be used routinely? Well, it's really important, I think, to make an assessment um, with the person with the eating disorders you know, of anxiety and depression, just as Natalie was saying about that you know, incredibly anxiety that she feels, and also with the low mood. And I mean, I would, I, as a GP, I would tend to use an SSRI that would give them some relief and enable them to you cope. Would. Well, I, I would. I'd love to hear what the panel says, yeah. because in a way, what I'm wanting to do is to enable them to cope, which an yeah. SSRI often allows them that. But I, I'm, I'm the GP. But I don't know what the experts would say. I, in people that I've spoken to, and you know, I had a mm. conversation with a psychiatrist who specialises in this area a couple of weeks ago, and I asked him that exact question, mm. and he said that because um, I said we know that there are a lot of studies out there that show that they actually, if you treat say depression with antidepressant medication, etc., you'll also improve the bulimia. And he said that in part some of that is that some of the medications are actually helping them to control the appetite as well. So it's giving them back some control over the binging behaviour. So it's that con contribution But there will be no well. control trials here. We're talking about unknown territory, aren't we? Yeah, yes, it would be. Yeah, and, and the other thing that he also mentioned that they said that they now are getting um, the evidence for is the omega-3s and that, that being very yeah. helpful in terms... So that'll be the antidepressant effect mm. yes. of omega-3 fatty yes, acids. Yes, that's right. A uh, question from Marissa Pillar, who's in Cairns. Is there any place for the use of the computer program Climate? And some studies show high dose zinc and weight training helps. Jenny? I think there have been a number of trials with the online information, online sort of self diagnosis. If that's what climate is, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with it. Can anybody else know what climate Anything is? Anything that helps engage the, the patient, I think, will help. The comment about weight training is an interesting one because what. Um we tried to do working through the academy and institute programs within elite sport was to get this shift from being skinny and thin and actually start working on being lean and strong and lean and strong was actually about the the strength or the weight gaining component so and you've got to eat to be strong yes you do and actually you know you might be looking more at the composition of you know if you, we, we used to call it because that was another question i had here from another yeah. viewer is how do you manage the line between the perfect competitive weight and an eating disorder and an elite athlete Exactly. And that's one way of doing it. They look at what they call, you know, um, O scales, which is looking at the bone mass, um, looking at the muscle mass, looking at the body fat. Uh, in the past, and uh, our, our academy in the ACT was one of the first to throw out skinfold testing because they used to come along and just measure people's body fat. And when you do that to teenagers whose bodies are changing, they were just exacerbating the issue. Um, so we actually we requested that, that that be ceased and it was at the, um, at the academy. And when we had individuals where we were trying to re-educate them and, and get the shift from you know, skinny to actually lean and strong, then doing mm. something by looking at O-scales uh, uh, could be helpful and could be beneficial. I uh, interviewed somebody at Stanford in their eating disorders clinic last year and they said red light, red light flashing online mm. because often people, kids are referred to online but there are all these sites yeah. which actually bolt them onto... Pro, there are pro-anorexia sites. So you, you think your kid's getting therapy but they're actually being bolted onto their problem? As parents I would say keep your eyes wide open. Um, knowing what I know, um, I can give you Eating Disorders Foundation of Victoria which I'm sure there are others but they actually have a chat line which is, or a chat room which is moderated, very very strongly moderated so they're only allowed to discuss uh, positive ways of managing your eating disorder, um, bringing out issues and being Not able Not being to, proud of it? Yes. Or yeah. competing or finding new techniques yeah, for yeah. purging? And um, we're working every day at, at ways of, of stopping these sites but it's, uh, it's a it's a big, big task. Um, so, so parents really need to be aware of what their kids are. So it's not just their friends they're talking to, it's somebody across the world. Yeah, yep. Who's giving them new tricks. Mm -hmm. let's, go to our, bit, let's go to our first case study. Jim's a 45-year-old dairy farmer. Things have been tough during the drought, and Jim's wife has made an appointment with, him, with you, Jane, as your patient. She's increasingly become concerned because he's lost a lot of weight in the last six months and he's eating very little. Well, I guess in a case like Jim, the first thing is that um, loss of weight doesn't necessarily mean an eating disorder. And somebody of that age in a rural area where we know there's droughts, there's increasing inflation, there's increasing petrol, there's probably enormous reasons to be depressed and anxious. And therefore, that can affect his appetite. 
The other thing is a GP, you really want to make sure that physically he's all right as well, that there's no illness that's affecting it and no malignancy or any other thing. And so if it talks like a duck, looks like a duck, walks like a duck, it is a duck. So in other words, he's more likely to be depressed than yeah, anything else. Yes. And you can always just, you know, there might be a few questions you might run past, just make sure he's not dieting and things, but so it's not the first thing I would think of. So if he's 22? 22 would be a bit different. I think it would depend on... I and think, buffed. And buffed. Well, that's what I was going to say. It would probably depend a bit about, you know, his appearance and his presentation and his concerns. So if he's concerned about the fact that he may not have lost enough weight, that his physique isn't right, is there something wrong with that? Is he doing enough exercise? And when you inquire that he's actually doing, you know, four or five hours a day or... Those are the things that would alert me that it might be something other than depression. But I, I think also in rural boys, you know, we do see depression and anxiety and it may result in some weight loss as well. So let's just stick with boys for a moment. Gay, you've got a 22-year-old mm. male with an exercise analogue of uh, anorexia nervosa but uh, eating disorder as well. What would you do about him? How would you assess him and what would you do about him? Mm. How would you help him? Um, the behaviours that tend to see more, I suppose, if I think about some of the individuals I've worked with, maybe more along the, the binging, the bulimia side mm -hmm. of it, so the purging behaviours. So the purging behaviours will often be um, maybe training in sweats to sort of like lose body fluid. Um, they would be excessive overtraining, so doing a lot of additional um, training sessions on top of you know what they're supposed to be doing. Um, they would be engaged in vomiting behaviour, they would be engaged in probably trying to use laxatives and diuretics, although diuretics um, will give you a positive blood test and could turf you out of a competition. Uh, so a number of things with working with individuals like that is, <clears throat> first of all, um, you've actually got to look at the motivation for the individual in the first place. So it's very difficult if they're actually, say, trying to make a weight category to compete in a particular competition and here you are very concerned about the fact that what they're doing is, is, not, is not healthy for their body or for their well-being. So you've got a duty of care responsibility there as well too. So coaches need to watch out. So coaches need to be aware um, and anyone else that's involved in you know, that, that, where that individual's life, so the, whole, the team or the crew or whatever often are people that might alert you in the first instance that they're concerned about a fellow athlete or a fellow competitor. So we need to hear that when, it, when it's given to us through a third party, because often they're the ones that are, are more aware. And then working with them, I've also found that uh, a lot of these individuals end up with what I call, um, it's a form of depression, but it's like a physiologically driven depression. So what happens is the demands that have been placed on them to compete hard, to train hard, and to do so with a really light body weight can also spiral them off into having a depressive episode. And I've worked with some individuals sometimes for up to two years to correct that post them having, you know, retired. And there are a number of individuals that you, I guess you have to once again look at the, the decision matrix between why you're doing this, the benefits from it and the costs from it. And there are a number of individuals that I've helped both in sport and in dance move out of that industry ultimately because but you, it wasn't But you hear of young men um, who are as of, you know, the, the, the six pack, Mm. is the analogue for the sylph-like female mm. model and that's what they're striving for in the, and they're not really involved in any sport. Yes. Jenny, what do you do about that situation? It's, yeah, well, talking to them, finding out what they're doing. If they're doing more than two hours exercise a day that's not related to their career or their sport, then that's probably too much. Does um, it go along with steroid abuse? It does, yes. It goes along with the whole gym environment, the whole peer group. You know, they spend their lives there. I, I had a, a patient a few weeks ago who, who would quite like to be married, but he spends his whole life at the gym lifting weights with his mates. And made himself impotent with his steroids. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, and very boring, you know, no conversation at all. So it does, it does go along with that uh, drive for muscularity. It goes along with steroid use. They're rife. Um, it, I had boys in my study who were injecting insulin to try to gain weight. I have boys who were taking all sorts of pills. They couldn't tell me what the pills were, but some drug dealer at a gym had sold them these pills to bulk them up. It's, um, it's a dangerous sort of And it's of presumably pattern. harder for them to see there's a problem than mm. somebody, say, in Natalie's situation. Mm. Well, that's right. It's not abnormal. Men are supposed to be big and tough and muscular mm. and um, 
you know, everyone at the gym uses these steroids. Norma, one, one approach that I found that I do use um, is to actually, once again, not to necessarily focus on what they're doing as, as, as being all negative. So I might actually look at what are the strengths and qualities it's actually taken this person. You know, they've got to have, be determined, they've got to be focused, they've set goals, and actually try and pull out some of the positives out of and the redirect disorder them. and redirect it and say, say, it's not because you're muscular or it's not because you're thin that you're this person, it's because you actually have all these qualities and abilities in the first instance that you've been able to channel them here. Where else would you like to channel them in mm. your life? Where exactly. else can you use them in a useful way you know, in your life? So actually make them aware of those strengths and you, so you're taking something positive out, out of what could initially be seen as, as dysfunctional. Do you get many calls, Natalie, from boys? Uh, actually last week I had four clients that were, bought, that were male, all different ages and stages. And that's something as well that you bring up before when we were talking about Jim, we were saying that he was um, in his 40s and then we went on to younger and all of a sudden we had this big conversation. It's really important to know that eating disorders don't discriminate with age at all. So, so you so could we, have a 45 year Yes, though. so we quite often do sit there and think, oh, well, they're too old for that. You know what I mean? Um, they're not necessarily. So it's certainly not something to, although it might not be the first thing on your mind, it's certainly not something Why to... Why did they call? Why do they call? Uh, what, made, most, what made them lift the phone? Most people who get to that point have gone through the denial part. They're, they get to a stage which um, they want to they wanna start acting. They've decided something's really, really wrong, but they want to prepare it. They don't want to just go in head first. So they'll ring up, and quite often I'll be their very first point of call. They've never disclosed to anybody in their lives. So they're, they're kind of rehearsing the path to recovery. Pretty much, yeah. And I mean, I can have people who have rung who have kept it hidden for 30 odd, mm. 40 odd years. So it's not, it's not just a little thing. It's, it's, it's such a hidden secret. So this secret. is part of the control. Absolutely. They want to map out every How step to fix along the way. Absolutely. So I'll quite often get calls from someone who said, nobody knows, I don't want anybody to know. Um, you were asking if my parents knew. I, I speak to people who have been married for 15, 20 years mm. and their partner has no idea that they've ever had an eating disorder. And that's why the GP is so important because they will go to the GP and they'll say, look, you know, I, I want to move on with my life. I, I want to change, you know, can you help me? And, and that relationship with the GP is perfect. I had an elderly aunt who was 80 who I reckon had anorexia nervosa mm. and still not, mm. not really admitted to the family. Let's go to our next case study. Ellie's mother consults a school counsellor, that's you Gay, about her 16-year-old daughter. She's concerned because Ellie's competitively dieting with other kids at school and she's lost a noticeable amount of weight in the last few months. Well, it's not unusual to start off with in that age group. When you think about it, young women um, hit puberty and oestrogen kicks in and they get hips and they get breasts and their body's changing. And at the same time that all those body changes are occurring, they're trying to figure out who they are, where they fit in, in, in the world and trying to establish some sort of identity for themselves. So that age group for some of them, that identity may be linked in with if I can't be the smartest girl in the school or the best musician or the best athlete, I can be the leanest or I can be the thinnest and that seems to be an aspect that they can get hooked into and they, and they focus and put a lot of energy into and it starts to sort of give them some definition of who they are. And as Natalie mentioned earlier, there's a lot of kudos. Natalie talked about the fact that when she first started dieting and losing weight, she got all these wonderful comments about how great that she looked and so it was very much reinforced. The first thing I'd probably do is be reassuring mum that it isn't unusual so that we're not sort of stigmatising it or making mum feel, you know, bad. And then we'd probably start looking at um, what we might be able to do in terms of so, But what, what assessment, given that this is, would you say this is a potentially fatal disorder, mm. what assessment are you going to do quickly the, at that first occasion first, to make sure she's not at the risk? The first thing that I would do in that instance is that I would ask mum to connect back with the GP and to have the GP have a look at her daughter with respect to some basic physiological assessments and they would be things like... So you deal with the head and allow the GP to deal with the you body? You first and foremost got to make sure that the individual's physically safe, that their physical well-being is safe and that's got to be the first port of so call. So you do that work up that Jane was talking about earlier? You would, that would be my, I would be referring her to the GP and then I would want to be communicating in liaison with support from the GP and the parents 
um, in terms of what we might do with the child and also look at what the school can do in terms of supporting that individual. So Natalie spoke to us about a lot of her anxieties. So if any of these anxieties are school-based anxieties, then we want to know what we can put in place in terms of pastoral care support to maybe reduce some of the anxieties around, for that individual while they're in the school environment. Um, and, then, and then there's the family work as well in terms of I have young people who sometimes are hesitant to come and speak to me. Maybe mum has come in or dad's come in. And I might do a number of sessions with mum and or dad before the young person even comes through my door. It's almost as Which if, is about that family therapy idea yes, that we spoke about earlier, reinforce the positive. Supporting the parents to understand what's going on, how they might open up the communication with their daughter, how they might actually What's the advice for mealtimes? For the mealtimes... Well, when you get to someone that is um, at that end in terms of concerns with it, I would probably look at referring them back to, once again, consultation with the GP. Where are we at right now? Actually, how far at risk are we talking about here? Yes, but I mean, the parents will ask, what do we do at mealtimes if she's not going to You need to normalise the mealtimes. So you don't want the family to adjust their eating to accommodate the disordered eating. So you want to normalise the young person into the family environment but you've also got to set really small and realistic goals and there's no point standing over the individual and trying to make them have the same sort of food that everybody else in the family But I've heard the family having. therapist say the, ch the child's got to attend dinner even yes. if they don't eat a lot. Yes, that's correct. But no, you've, got to, you've got to look at what's but realistic. But you don't have a battle over it. It's the socialisation yeah. around it. It's not the eating per se, it's the format and the structure. You're talking about control again. Um, having that structure at, at a certain time of the day is it's, uh, it's therapy in itself. Really. And, if, and if the child says, no, I'm not coming to dinner? Who's the parent? Ooh. <laughs> I mean, really, if, if you, obviously you'll have your sporting and you'll have your jobs and, and it's not always ideal to sit down at a table. But if you establish a routine in your household... Um, and you put food in front of her or him, and if it's not eaten, you just take the plate away at the end of the meal. Well, I think sometimes the parents are sitting there for a very long period of time because there's a minimum amount that the individual needs to eat to say physically safe and, and, and the consequences that, that um, Natalie shared with us were well, you're going to go to hospital and we're going to force you to have this amount of food and we're going to take all these privileges away is, is very real if these minimum amounts aren't sort of met or aren't consumed but they need to be done in consultation with the young person and they need to be realistic. Jenny? Yeah, I was just saying with the family, you know, trying to get them to come to a table might be something that they, they never do. So getting them to eat together just to role model that eating and giving the girl lots of, um, or the boy, um, encouragement and positive feedback and that's good and you're getting better. It'll stop your, your fainting, you'll perform better at sport, your brain will operate better at school, this food is, is going to be good for you. It's not the enemy, it's, it's going to help you. You've still got to cross that threshold to start eating, yeah. which is, can be quite hard. Three peas and that's excellent. Mm. <laughs> and that's, that's important, what, what um, Jenny just said then. It's about um, looking at what their stage they're at and encouraging that stage. If, if you say to someone who hasn't eaten for a long time, OK, here's a full three-course meal, eat all of this, off we go. If they eat three peas on their plate, that's something to really be congratulated. They've, they've eaten it, they've kept it down. They've if they can establish that pattern for a couple of weeks, and that's mm. something to be celebrated, not to be, oh, you still haven't eaten much. I mean, what you say around that is, is, is huge. So then you let it grow, it's something they can manage. If, if, you, uh, if you were asked to, to run a marathon next week and you've done no training, can you do it? It's, it's not humanly possible and it's overwhelming. Let's take, a, let's take a moment to have a look at Holding On. It's a DVD produced by Natalie's organisation, the Eating Disorders Foundation of Victoria. I ate as an instinctive thing to cover up lots of feelings as I was growing up. Fear, hatred, hurt, pain. And so when I was hurt, I would eat. And I didn't understand what was happening and I didn't understand why I was doing that. So that emotional thing became a habit and that habit became problematic in my life because I would use it every day, all day, you know, to deal with things. I don't know how to describe the relationship I had with food. It was a love-hate relationship. It was my best friend. It was my lover. It was comfort. It made me feel good about myself. It made me feel different and special, I suppose. And that's not certainly not the way that I see it now because, I, you know, the way I see it now is that that doesn't make you special at all. It steals who you are. 
So there's no you left anymore and there was no me left. The one thing that my parents could not control is what I ate, I guess. And um, automatically by taking that power away, um, I guess um, I began to live my own life. And um, so it was a control issue for me. I was m most concerned about um, keeping on with the disease. I mean, it was part of my life and it was something that I really wanted, as strange as that sounded. And I didn't want anybody to threaten it. Anorexia bulimia, unfortunately, became a tool as to how I dealt with everyday life. If something was difficult, I ran to anorexia and bulimia nervosa. Um, I, I, be, I would binge, binge eat and vomit, uh, make myself sick, and wouldn't have to worry about the, my day. I was doing well at school. I had great friends. I, family life was as it should be. There was nothing out of the ordinary for me. And this was a release for any feelings of self-doubt I had. I thought I was being really brilliant and I could think of a way to lose weight, which was just to, to vomit, to, to eat as much as I wanted and then throw it all up again. And I thought I was really, really clever. I just thought I had a, a healthy exercise habit and a healthy food habit. <laughs> and to think um, I got so ill so quickly, um, didn't even figure. Self-esteem, confidence and control, and they're three things that I've always struggled with. I mean, before I got to my teen years, you know, I'd always like been a performer, but somebody only had to say one thing to me and I'd just curl up into my shell and it was really easy, for, it was very sensitive, really easy for me to, you know, someone would make a genuine criticism and I'd take it to heart and curl up in a little ball. And so, you know, that the self-esteem feeling like, I mean, I was always a perfectionist at school and you know I've got my mum's got pictures of me when I was like three years old and I've got my socks pulled up perfectly level and she said you know I had to have my pigtails equal and I had to have my socks level and that was the thing you know perfection and that if I couldn't get what I wanted it made me really angry and I suppose in a way you know being making yourself sick is a kind of self-harm thing and it's a punishment as well so while it did make me feel better I was punishing myself on occasions. Holding on the video from the Eating Disorders Foundation of Victoria. Um, Jenny, what can a general practitioner do to encourage uh, this weight issue? This is a question from a general practitioner in Victoria. Look, I think um, the relationship with the GP needs to be strong and ongoing from childhood right through to adolescence. If you have a young person in your office, they love to have their height done. They like that reinforcement from the doctor that they're growing nicely. This is your stage of puberty, this is where you're headed. You will become rounder and more voluptuous and that's normal. You know, you, your body is growing very beautifully. That's a very positive thing. Permission to have body fat? Yes. Do you do that, Jane? Well, I wish I did. <laughs> no. but, but you will for, now. I will definitely now. But I think that, that there is that positive reinforcement, making sure that you have a relationship with um, the young woman, the teenager, um, that is, you know, positive, non-judgmental, um, mm. supportive and caring. Tell me what you do in a country town to get help when you've got a, a difficult one that you really find you're losing the plot on. Yeah, well, th and this can be very difficult because, you know, we're, we're, it's wonderful tonight to be able to listen to everybody here. But often if you're in a, a remote, especially remote or rural inland areas, you know, you don't have a lot of um, facilities that you can call on. Generally, there's always a community health service so that there will be a dietitian with that and there will be a social worker and maybe a psychologist. Um, if you're in a larger regional area, there are probably more people that you can draw on because there might be some private practitioners. And then you can use things like your EPCs and mental health care plans so you can start building teams. And I guess the thing is, you know, just to actually be brave enough as a GP just to hang in there, no matter if you don't know what to do next. And as soon Keep as you get a chance, alive. ring somebody up, you know, because there's always an expert somewhere, and I've always found them to be very supportive. Um, a mother watching us in New South Wales comments that um, her daughter had uh, bulimia and anorexia for 10 years, the BMI of 16 and nothing worked, but the, the Swedish system did the mandometer scene. Now, they've moved to Victoria, that scheme now. What's your view of the Swedish system? Um, the Swedish system has had uh, more studies behind it than most of the others. So it's, it's I think... And for people who don't know anything about it, okay. it's, I've referred to it obliquely, but it's 
it's warming, it's, uh, it's fixing up the teeth, there is, uh, there is counseling, cognitive behavioral therapy, and there's refeeding, which is speed and content on a, on a computerized system. That's right. Um, they actually, it's interesting because they don't believe that it's psychological at all. Um, everybody has their own views on that one, I guess, yet they do use psychological practices yes. when you go and speak to them they they do Absolutely. so yeah. um, the one thing that they do that nobody else does is they monitor them for years afterwards and so being going through all those control perfectionism etc cetera, etc cetera, these guys will quite often keep working at it because they know someone's going to pull them up on mm -hmm. it later on and say how are you going what are you doing um, they're not going out of the system and then being forgotten about until right. they they're recommitted to so, so they're doing for weight gain what other people do for weight loss <laughs> yeah that's that's it okay. yeah. is uh, a question here is sexual or emotional abuse connected with eating disorders Jenny yeah there are a few studies that talk about the high risk in um, homosexual men that there's a very high pressure to be thin and to have a perfect body um, nothing conclusive. There's strong. Um, this is talking about abuse rather than yep, your, yep. your yes. orientation. Yes, there's uh, strong links with sexual abuse, and you know you can see the emotion, um, the the psychological problems coming out in the eating disorder. So there is a relationship with sexual abuse. Getting a, a question from a general practitioner in Queensland. It seems that many members of straight, many Australian coaches need to be educated about the impact of their activities on, um, on weight and eating disorders. Is there much education going on in the sports arena in this area, particularly at school sport level, mm, club sport? I, I would absolutely agree that we need to do a lot more of it. Um, the Australian Coaching Council in the past used to include it as part of its training for its athletes, but I don't know whether or not that that's still um, up and running. I would think, generally speaking, that we do a reasonably good job with our teachers, but we don't necessarily include it as a requirement for coach education at the different coaching levels that um, the, the coaches might actually go through. So I'd like to actually see more of it as well too. There's another question here, um, Natalie, about websites uh, from general practitioners in South Australia, actually pharmacists, sorry, in South Australia, about um, websites and which ones to avoid and whether schools should be blocking these and indeed parents mm. should be blocking them. Mm. Okay, anything that um, is pro-anorexic, pro pro-eating disorder, in other words, um, promoting the behaviours, uh, talking about them and, and quite often when people are in the throes of an eating disorder they want new ideas on how they can support it um, and they will find, they will source it out if they need it. Um, and the, this is where awareness has to be yeah. um, on people who don't have eating disorders really. Um, most of the eating disorders foundations in the different state, states, they're pretty safe. You, you, you're looking at people who are working with people with eating disorders every day and um, if you're not sure, uh, ring the helplines and they'll lead you in the right direction. I think um, it, schools and parents should definitely block the sites. They're really pernicious sites. They, they encourage the eating disorder. Um, they, they're called pro-ana sites or pro-mia sites. So they might be promoting anorexia nervosa. They're promoting bulimia and they say it's just a lifestyle uh, choice. Um, as a GP, this is from a general practitioner in New South Wales, a GP who has a very close friend who's a dentist mm -hmm. who, can see, who sees the erosions mm -hmm. with the bulimia, uh, how can we share information about this? Have you got any suggestions, Jane? Well, I think communication between all health professionals is a great thing. It doesn't always happen, but even if they can just, um, you know, just ask that, pe that person, you know, talk about it as um, can be done and just ask them to see their doctor, perhaps just bring up about that they've noticed it and you know perhaps why it may occur, what their experience is in the past. But communication is good. So uh, we're running out of time but we must touch base with bulimia. Gay, typical presentation, what's the story with bulimia that parents and GPs should be looking out for? Well the sort of presentation that I would normally see is often a, a young a girl in her teenage years. She might be in the last two years at school, say 11 and 12, so there's a lot of pressure around academic performance and exams. She's quite likely also um, got a talent in either the music area or dance or sport or some other interest that she's also endeavouring to perform really well in. Um, and she might be involved in school reviews, things like that. So you've got these young people that have got a lot happening in their life, a lot of stress, a lot of high expectations, and they start to feel 
you know, that they're out of control. And the slipping into the bulimic behaviour can be one way of trying to find some aspect of their life that they can feel that they are in control So what are they doing, Natalie? What's the recognisable, is it just sort of leaving after every course at the table and you suddenly disappear to the toilet or what? Uh, it can vary. Um, usually it'll be if they go off on their own, whether it be to the toilet or whether it be, um, but it doesn't have to be immediately after. Sometimes, uh, especially if they think they're being watched, they'll hold on till they know they're in a safe zone where they can. Um, time limits, if they've got a time limit, if they know that everybody's going to leave the table in 20 minutes, they'll wait for 20 minutes um, mm -hmm. because everybody leaves. And you might look at other things like changes in mood swings, um, energy levels, um, whether there's a shift or change in their ability to concentrate and, and focus on things. Are they sort of isolating themselves from situations where they would maybe normally meet with friends and have a meal? Um, there are all sorts of behaviours that may indicate that something could be going on for that young person. So what do we do about it, Jenny? What's the management? What's the assessment and what's the management? Well, I think the, the differential diagnosis is really important for the GP. You're trying to work out what you're dealing with. You're trying to work out if you're dealing with anorexia nervosa or bulimia nervosa um, or a whole array of eating disorders. So I think, you know, interviewing, really doing good histories, getting a, a handle on what you think you're dealing with is very important. Checking the, the, the bloods and the pr blood pressure regularly, keeping the patient coming back to you regularly so you don't lose track of them. I think that's the important thing for, for treatment. It's going to take a long time. You might as well tell the parents that it's going to take a But what's a long the therapy time. that works? Is there any? I think Just hand holding? Well, it depends. You know, if you have a 13-year-old a, a girl who's lost so much weight that she's passing out, then you'll need but to put her in But that's more anorexia hospital. than bulimia, isn't it? Oh, the treatment for bulimia, it's psychological. It's, it's cognitive behavioural therapy. The, the, the classic sign with bulimia is they simply cannot stop eating. It's totally out of control. And they'll come to you because they've gained weight. So you're trying to find those triggers, or the therapist, the counsellor is trying to find those triggers that trigger this out of control eating behaviour. So you're looking at trying to um, look at regulation of thoughts and emotions because we know that how we think can affect how we feel, can affect how we do or what we do and, and can go back the other way. So with working with a young person that's um, suffering from bulimia, you're looking for um, sometimes the psychological and emotional links that might actually, like you said, uh, trigger the, bur the purging behaviour in the first instance. It's the binging behaviour. And you might also be looking at, I meant to say binging behaviour, <laughs> you're also looking at um, factors um, such as you know helping them develop some life skills and strategies about what other choices that they might have to deal with those um, periods of anxiety which would trigger the behaviour. Um, so you're trying to help um, increase their awareness so you get them to start looking at things like what's actually going on, what are their mental processes, what are their thinking processes. Um, we're going to start listening to ourselves internally and then we try and make the links between when a, uh, an event might occur in that young person's life that might then re, um, end up triggering off a, um, a purging behaviour or a binging behaviour. And so you're actually trying to get the awareness happening first and then upskill them with a range of different things that give them alternative choices about which approach that they might take to deal with those issues that are currently causing them distress. And I think to add to that as well is that you cannot change another human being's mind. So if these guys are in a set, a headset where they're not ready yet, they're still listening all the time. And, and everybody, as I said, with aha moments, everybody, or so far it seems most people have aha moments where they something just clicks. So although you cannot make somebody start to get better from an eating disorder when you're saying holding hands, you can create awareness, you can uh, bring out communication, you can educate yourself. You can give them um, options. You can give them lots of options and the more options they have, the more they realise they can possibly if control something they're not ready to let go of yet, they can see that there's other ways they can maintain that control without having to be destructive with yes. it. So you're actually empowering them to make some smarter choices or decisions and by giving them lots of options you're actually letting them fit what best suits them so there's no one sort of technique that you would actually 
teach a young person that's got bulimia but you would look at a, a range of different possibilities and, and it will fit, the individual will know what will fit best with them or what they feel is something that, that might work for them. Jane, just, and just finally, the, we heard from Jenny earlier about what she thinks is the role of the GP to right from early childhood to kind of prepare mm. uh, the child for the growing up process and that it's okay to be, you know, it's a normal thing to become a bit more rounded, etc, etc. But what do you think is the role of the GP in terms of early prevention and early detection and intervention? Well, I think often, you know, as a GP, you are in that position where you are seeing young teenagers, you're able to perhaps just pick up, um, you know, changes in diet, changes in behaviour, fainting or not coping with sport so that you can see that in the whole picture you don't have to be thinking eating disorder but you can be thinking you know about giving good information you might just make sure that you monitor it make sure you get them back regularly um, and I think it's really important as GPs just just listening to what everyone was just saying is that often you know we don't know what to do you know it can be it, if it's a severe case it can be very daunting as a GP um, but if we just do stay with it, you know, and just see that person regularly, we at least give them an environment where they can gain information if they want, they can fail if they want, they can come back, and as long as they know that that's all right and we're not going to get angry with them, mm. and which is, as a GP, it's really hard when people don't get better, okay. so that we can do that, then we're giving, we're doing the most important thing we can. And, you know, it's really lovely to have all that extra input today about what little things that we can do in terms of behavioural stuff. And Gay, what's your takeaway message for those watching? I think trying not to be judgmental and actually separating the illness out from the person and recognise that they're, they're two separate entities so that you can keep the um, self-confidence and self-esteem and value of the individual in, intact. Natalie? Um, I would say that eating disorders do not discriminate. That's really important to hold on to. And also that inside, the strength that keeps and supports an eating disorder is the same strength that will get you through recovery and maintaining it forever. Jenny? Take home message. Um, I guess that... Um, buy your book. <laughs> yes, buy my book. And make sure that your local high school is, um, is doing sensible things in health classes. But I think one message that the GP, certainly Jane's, hit on it is that you're a worthy person. Keep com coming back and seeing me. You know, your worth is not about your weight. Thank you all very much very important program and I hope you've enjoyed the program on eating disorders tonight. If you're interested in obtaining more information about the issues raised there are a number of resources available on the Rural Health Education Foundation's website rhef.com.au and here's the number of the Eating Disorders Foundation of Victoria which you can ring from anywhere in Australia 1300 550 236. Don't forget to complete and send in your evaluation forms and please register for CPD points by completing the attendance sheet. Our thanks to the Department of Health and Ageing for making the program possible, but thanks to you for taking the time to attend and contribute. I'm Norman Swan. From all of us, bye for now.